Before I introduce him and, and launch the talk, though, I want to take advantage of the fact that you are here to advertise our next talk, which is on the 21st of April. We're bringing in General Alexander, the former head of the National Security Agency, that will continue the discussion on cyber and, um, and we'll begin the discussion today, and, and General Alexander will, will finish it on the 21st of April. But you came to hear Joe Nye, who, uh, among other things, has been won the poll that said the most influential academic, uh, influential in policy terms, uh, professors, who's written widely. I win bar bets by uh, with people on what was his very first area of specialty, and almost no one can ever get this one right. But he started out as an activist, and his dissertation book, first book, was on. Uh, peace and um, regional organizations in Africa. Uh, but he's gone on from that to, uh, to make important contributions in many other areas, especially in the area of American foreign policy. He was professor then dean at the Kennedy School. He also served uh, in government, uh, first in the Carter administration, the State Department on nonproliferation issues, and then uh, in the Clinton administration, uh, in the National Intelligence Council, and also in the Defense Department, um, and is, is one of the, the leading policy practitioner uh, academics that we've got. Um, and I've got a lot, we have also established mutual assured destruction here. I have stories on him, <laughs> far too many stories on, on me. He, he says that the only blot on his record is that he allowed me to go. <laughs> so welcome, Joe. So what I thought we'd do, before we dive into your, uh, your recent work on cyber deterrence, uh, we've got to talk about the issue of the day, which is the, the strikes in Syria. So give us your reaction to Trump's decision. Do you think it was wise, hasty, uh, what, what appeals to you about it, what worries you about it? Well, I thought, <clears throat> first of all, it's nice to be back at Duke. And, uh, but I thought the issue of the day was Peter Peter. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I won't tell all my stories because I wrote a novel a few years ago called The Power Game, a Washington novel. And the hero the protagonist is named Peter Tucker. But it's really Peter Peter. <laughs> so if you want to really know Peter Peter's stories, I won't tell them all this afternoon. But you can look up at the novel. Find out. Peter. That's ominous because it doesn't go well for Cutler. He goes to DC and, and he has a moral crisis and the whole world collapses. <laughs> Other than that, <laughs> uh, no, but, it, but more seriously, the uh, I, it is interesting. The issue of the day was supposed to be would Trump uh, manage to have a, uh, a successful summit with Xi Jinping in Mar a Lago. And uh, instead, we're all talking about bombing uh, Assad and ruining the relations with the Russians. And so uh, it reminds me of a famous statement by Harold Macmillan, the former British prime minister, when he was asked by some young student uh, prime minister, what's the most important thing to understand when you're going to make policy? He said, events, dear boy, events. And there are always things that come 
to take you by surprise. But I, think, I, I, I told Peter earlier, I, I think Trump was, was correct to, uh, to bomb this air base and the smart to use cruise missiles for the standoff and to warn the Russians that uh, get your personnel out of the way. Uh, but it's a one-off. I mean, I think it's important that he did it. I wish Obama had done it, because I think it's important to reinforce the norm against the use of chemical weapons. And uh, if Assad had gotten away with this again, uh, that norm would be seriously depleted. So uh, sometimes uh, it's worth uh, it's worth punishment and pain, even if it doesn't reverse it. People say, okay, what's the next step of the strategy? Would be, you know, what are we going to do with Assad and these chemicals again? Um, I don't know, and I hope he has a strategy. I would be surprised if he does. But I'm nonetheless glad that he did read that. Well, where he goes next. This whole rhetoric, and to the extent that he had a foreign policy, it was coherent. It was to stay out, to stand off. In that sense, uh, Trump and Obama worked that differently in Syria. Now, you've written a book on leaders and the qualities of leadership, and I won't ask you to analyze Trump as a quality of uh, his qualities as a leadership, but. Perhaps the most surprising thing about his decision was the 180 degree reversal within such a short period of time. And even he described it in something like those terms as did H.R. McMaster. When you have a leader that makes such an abrupt reversal, what, what does that alarm other, the rest of the world? Does that build up credibility? What does that do? Well, you know, Trump talked in the campaign about uh, admiring Nixon's uh, Bad man theory, in which Nixon who wasn't a bad man, may have been a bad man, but not a bad man. Uh, <laughs> Nixon uh, said that if you want to make your deterrence seem credible, you have to act as though you will do quite outrageous things. And he was talking about this in terms of getting resolution in the Vietnam War. It didn't work for him, but uh, but uh, Trump. 2016, uh, said that he liked the Batman theory. There's a little bit in it. Tom Schelling, the great theorist of deterrence, used to talk about this. He said, uh, you know, the, the great thing about uh, if you really want to win a game of chicken, you have to prove that you're quite crazy. He said, uh, you, you, when you come to a traffic circle or a roundabout, uh, and you want to prove to the other incoming driver that you're going to make it, you take the steering wheel and hang it out the window. And, uh, you know, it's likely to get the other guy to break. There was a joke that uh, had uh, uh, Tom Schelling's assistant, Mort Halperin, showing up in bandages one day in class. And said, what happened to you, Mort? He said, well, I took the steering wheel and hung it out the window, but the other driver was Tom Schelling. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the danger of a, of a, of a, of a of that strategy to winning chicken, which is uh, if you you can develop a reputation, uh, and it may help you turn effect. But the other uh, reputation you want to develop is consistency. And uh, if you're if you're undercutting your reputation for consistency, you may pay a higher price than it's worth. Is, uh, just one more question on Trump as a leader. If you say that this is his <coughs> finest moment, would you say that this is his finest foreign policy moment? <laughs> it's a pretty low barrier. Well, <laughs> <laughs> what would you say is his finest moment? What, what, what would you say is his least um, successful moment just in the 80 days that he's been president? Well, in foreign you know, policy, leave aside domestic. You know, policy. in foreign policy, I think the interesting thing about Trump in the 2016 campaign, he was the first president or first candidate of a major party in 70 years who was calling into question the post-45 American world order. Uh, 
we had deep fights over intervention in developing countries like Vietnam or Iraq, but there was nobody who questioned the alliance structure that was created by Harry Truman. And uh, the idea that unlike World War I, where we brought the troops home after World War II, we didn't, that they're there to this day, uh, that had created a, and that we developed institutions, uh, the UN and the associated bodies, the World Trade Organization, and so forth. Uh, that had created a, a sense of stability and direction in world politics, which Trump questioned. And uh, the, I would say his finest moment before this was sending Mike Pence to the Munich Security Conference uh, and, and Jim Mattis to the Munich Security Conference and having them reassure this conference, which is sort of an annual conclave of the top security figures around the world. Um, and, uh, Having them reassure, particularly that NATO was not obsolete, and I think that plus is uh, reaffirming to Prime Minister Abe of Japan that we were going to maintain the U.S.-Japan security treaty. That meant that the questioning that Trump had done in the campaign to appeal to a group of people, particular electors, uh, where that that sort of we've been suckers. We're going, to, we're going to make them re-bargain issue by issue. Uh, we'll pull out of some places. At one point, he said the Japanese and the Koreans can go get their own nuclear weapons. And things which are really quite radical and quite dumb and quite destructive of a successful 70-year strategy. He had the sense, at least, to reverse that and reverse it very quickly. So the, the American World Order in 1945, I think the alliance structure is unlikely to collapse. What's going to happen to the institutions, the UN, the World Trade Organization, so forth, that still very much up in the air. But so I would argue that that reaffirming the alliances, I, I, I was at the this conference with Pence and Mattis gave their speech, and there was almost an audible sigh of relief, but then the next thing was, but does he mean it? Uh, but I think that it was the most important thing in some foreign policy was, was to say, whatever I said in the campaign, I don't mean I'm going to destroy the alliance part of the post-World War II America. Um, this particular act is interesting in the sense that he had said that uh, he wasn't going to worry much about humanitarian issues or human rights issues. And then he got pulled into his 180 return. Um, and I, you know, I, I think it was smart for him politically, because I think it did give him, it does give him some credibility to watch out for the I can talk a little bit like Ronald Reagan's firing the air traffic. In 1981, it was very helpful for Reagan on foreign policy, not just domestic policy. Uh, so I think, in that sense, Trump Trump has an intuitive sense, of, uh, which has grown out of years of marketing in real estate and uh, being a, a unpredictable, a somewhat outrageous figure on reality TV. Has given him the capability. works sometimes and doesn't work others. So we have to see what the next steps are. He certainly wrong-footed a lot of uh, people, including his critics. And there's probably a half dozen quotes that I've given in the press in the last week that's, that were all pegged to his statements about how we're not going to care about human rights, we're not going to. So I have a whole lot of, of sage uh, Peter, opinion you're, on that. You're quoted so frequently in the New York Times. That you just, you know, just you're wrong each time. Quote. Yes, I'm wrong each time. I'll be wrong on any day, but um, but then once in a while I'll be right. Let's stop. But uh, so setting setting the strikes, airstrikes aside 
for a moment. I realize that's like saying, aside from that, Mrs. Lincoln, how about the play? Aside from that, how would you have assessed the, the run up to the uh, summit with Xi Jinping in Mar-a-Lago? And what were the prospects for a good outcome from that before the strikes? And what are the prospects for a good outcome now that, that he conducted the strikes or he ordered that the strikes happen while they were at dinner? With the president, and so I think that you know, talk a little bit about. How well, I, might I think it. the uh, one of the big questions of this century, in terms of stability, is going to be how we manage uh, the rise of power in China, and uh, I think we can manage it. I don't think there's an existential threat from China. Uh, it's not like it were Germany or Stalin. will have differences, but there will also be overlaps in areas of commonality. I think uh, managing that relationship with China is going to be absolutely crucial. And Trump, again, in the campaign, used rhetoric, which was very hostile, you know, declaring China a currency manipulator on day one of the new administration, which was Jan 20. Well, Jan 20 is come and gone, and it's not yet a currency. And the other thing Trump said was that uh, we would put 45% tariffs on Chinese trade. Uh, well, if that were to happen, or it still does happen, uh, it's going to be enormously disruptive of our economy, their economy, and the world trade system. Uh, so we'll have to see whether that happens. I mean, it sounds to me like unlikely. The other thing he did was flirt with reversing the one China policy that has been in place since Nixon and Kissinger. Uh, and he backed away from that very quickly. So Trump, Trump, the performer who uses outrageous statements to keep the camera focused on it, which is the secret of reality TV, and which is a very good form of this is why the 16 other candidates in the Republican primary couldn't get the oxygen. Because all the publicity was focused on Trump. That works. The question is, does that work when you're governing? And um, what we've seen so far is he's walked back from those most outrageous positions. And we'll have to see whether it continues. I don't know what the press release will be about Trump and Xi uh, the night after Mar-a-Lago was finished. Uh, it looked like it wasn't going to be high confrontation. And um, I don't know. I mean, I think I don't think Trump arranged the bombing or the timing of the bombing for those purposes. But if if you talk tough about China and you're not going to be tough on China, it might not hurt to have, you know, distract people with something else. I mean, the, the, the most effective thing that Trump does with his tweets is if dogs are barking at his, at his heels, he throws a bone and all the dogs chase after him. And he treats the press that way. You know, if, he, if he's on a weak policy issue, he tweets about something totally outrageous, which the press can't resist, and they all go rushing after that tweet. In the meantime, the issue where they were biting his heels was going away. So he, I mean, as a, as a manipulator of media, and that's part of leadership, uh, communications is really part of leadership. You've got to give the guy credit. Uh, and I don't know, we'll have to see how. Uh, how the U.S.-China relationship looks next week. Well, it's the other great power relationship that was upended by this was, of course, U.S.-Russia relations. And Trump came in seeming to want to have a reset in relations with Putin. Um, do you think that's even possible now? How, how, would, how would you think these attacks uh, will play out in the U.S.-Russian relations? 
relations, particularly Putin-Trump relations? Well, it, it, I, one of the odd things about uh, uh, my personal view of Trump, where I disagree with much of what he said on foreign policy, was I thought he is trying to get better communications with Russia, and that's important. Uh, I'm all for sanctions against Russia, but I also think he's got to do business with Russia. And I think the Obama administration has let that doing business uh, uh, degrade too much. And so if Trump and Tillerson, Tillerson who knew Putin personally, were able to restore you know, uh, reasonable negotiations, bargaining, uh, that might be a good thing. Uh, but in some ways, uh, Putin overdid it. I mean, the degree to which they interfered in the American election and, uh, and pushed it, in, it, it, instead of just degrading the American process, pushed it in favor of Trump, has tied Trump's hands and also distracted, not in this case, it's a bone that's right at its feet rather than away. And so he's, he's been distracted. He can't get back on a campaign with Russia in the way he wants. In some ways, Putin was too clever by half. He overdid it. If he had just done it, uh, see the Americans with their democratic system are messy and they're no better than we are, uh, it might have worked. But by, by trying to undercut and promote Trump, which was the consensus opinion of the intelligence community. This is not just a political charge. Uh, Putin poisoned the well here. So you have people in Trump's own party, like Rams and Clinton and Kane and others, uh, who are not going to cut him any slack on Russia, because they might have cut him if the Russians had pushed this too far. So, so I don't think Putin's option, I mean, Trump's options, I wish he had his options on improving relations with Russia had been better. But Putin had spoiled that. And now with the bombing, uh, I think uh, Trump is ready to be more. Do you, how do you think Putin will respond? Do you think Putin will, uh, he's famously uh, mercurial himself and, and values surprise and, and his risk acceptance. So. Will he escalate? It's possible. Then the question is what kind of escalation? And people need to pay for it. I think, uh, I think Putin realizes that he's bitten off a little bit more than he can digest from China. And I think he sees that it would probably be more useful for him to try to calm the Americans down. Uh, he's stirred things up too much. Uh, people that I know who said that Putin wants to keep Russian troops in the Donbass region and keep fighting there at low levels so that he is a lever in Ukraine so that he can, he can constantly keep a degree of control. He can't control Ukraine, but he has his lever, which means that the Ukrainians can't get out from under the Russian threat or influence. At one point, people thought, well, why wouldn't he take the next step up to Mariupol or even to Odessa or something, you know, wouldn't he escalate further? I think, it, I think that what I'm told is that to be militarily overextended. Mm -hmm. They become quite vulnerable if he did And uh, also politically quite costly. So yeah, Putin might do something. He, he is risk exception and then he's declining powers on risk exception. Um, but I think he's also pragmatic and prudent. And I think he realizes that, that, that pushing his luck at this time will probably not make much sense in his interest. So I, I you know, I would be surprised if he does. There's been so many news stories that have commanded attention this week. If current events hadn't happened, I suspect this 
story I'm about to ask you about would have been the big story of the week. This is the reports that the CIA and the FBI uh, had advised President Obama pretty early on, as early as the summer 2016, about the extent of Russian involvement um, in the uh, elections. And raising the question of well, why didn't why didn't that information come out earlier? Did Putin get away with it? Did, did, did Obama unintentionally, perhaps, uh, get, create a permissive environment for this kind of, of um, meddling and cyber intrusion? So what's your view of that? Do you think that uh, President Obama missed, a, missed an opportunity, should have called them out sooner, should have taken the intelligence warnings more seriously at the time? Yeah, I think Obama should have acted sooner and uh, uh, more publicly. But I think, it, I mean, as best I can reconstruct this, uh, there were two Russian units that were penetrating American political system. Uh, one was uh, the GRU, which is military intelligence, and the other was uh, uh, the FSB. And they got They didn't coordinate this. They were each in their, in their own bureaucratic, entrepreneurial way intervening. And at some point, according to the intelligence, our intelligence, maybe Putin had to prove this. But it originally starts with um, you know, mili military intelligence and foreign intelligence going out to see what they can do. And, I, and it's, it's plausible that when Putin approved this, uh, it was designed to damage Clinton. That Putin disliked because Clinton had her internet freedom agenda and, uh, from 2010 to 2012, and that, that uh, there was criticism of uh, Putin's election in 2012. I mean, he, he felt that Clinton had been interfering in his politics. So he was happy to see things that were done that damaged Clinton. But then um, they took it the next step and said, well, you know, we're doing this damage to Clinton. Maybe we can help Trump. And Putin apparently proved that, so I, I don't know for sure on that. But what's interesting is that this really starts, I mean, the GRU part that starts in 2015. I mean, it, it goes way back, and the, I think the, the other, they, they call them APT, Advanced Persistent Threat, meaning that a hacking group that is more than just normal hackers, they have the full capacity of, the, of a government intelligence agency. And then these two APTs, uh, the Sanger says, these two bodies are so close that I can walk between them and have time to get a cup of Starbucks coffee and still have 15 minutes left over. You know, it's, it, it, the idea that the FBI called and didn't follow up 
and the DNC functionary who picked up the phone and didn't follow up is just unbelievable incompetence. So this doesn't blame Obama. This is this is this is an illustration of uh, uh, the poor coordination of bureaucracies or organizations. But uh, by by the time that uh, that some of this becomes more clear around August. cyber hotline, where it's actually using a nuclear hotline before cyber issues um, a few years ago. So we had crises in cyber. So they use that to say to the Russians, knock it off. But they don't go public in a big way. They don't, they don't do a naming and shaming or a big thing. And the, if they ask the question, why didn't they, there was a that they would do Putin's work for him. In other words, that if they raised the, at that time, the belief that Clinton would win, and if they raised this issue and made it a big uh, uh, public scandal, rather than help Clinton might hurt. And so that, uh, so they played it really key. In some ways, before the election, uh, we were self deterred because we thought that the making it a big fuss would hurt us more than hurt them. So they did it through private channels or you know government government channels, but they didn't do it in a, uh, in a major uh, public name and shame. Then gradually I want to they find out what's in here. As they, uh, after the election and they realized how far this is going, they're no longer deterred by the number of hurting <coughs> So they start to raise it more publicly. And then finally, uh, uh, Obama expels uh, 25 or so Russian spies and um, uh, says that we may do something in cyber. We have no idea what may or may not happen. And um, what's interesting then is that usually in the Cold War, you expel a bunch of spies. said to him, don't worry, Trump will take care of it, so don't overreact. And then the thing just continued to escalate uh, in terms of American domestic politics to the point where Trump can't act. So it's, a, it's it, you know, I think Obama made a mistake. I think that's my explanation of, of how the mistake was made. I mean, that he should have gone at it harder and faster sooner. But it does raise interesting questions about deterrence, which is uh, when you're deterring things in cyber, we often talk about cyber warfare, people talk about cyber Pearl Harbor, there. Leon Panetta, the, the uh, Secretary of Defense, talked about cyber Pearl Harbor. The idea is that a country would put malware into our electrical grid and then uh, Zap us, turn out all the lights. And if you're in Boston in February or Chicago in February, uh, you kill a lot of people that way. It's not just in the deep. Uh, fortunately, here it is mild, yeah. and I climb it in the term, you don't have these problems. <coughs> but, uh, the, uh, but that cyber Pearl Harbor question uh, gets into what the government has said. 
Pentagon have said, the White House has said, which is that uh, we will treat a cyber event which has major damaging kinetic effects as the equivalent of war. In other words, you don't, just because it's done by cyber doesn't mean it's exempt. You have a, the, the, the standard we use for what, when we're going to react is equivalence or kinetic equivalence. And so if you look at the Pentagon the White House statement, that's that, uh, what it is. But the problem is that when you look at uh, information warfare, um, it's in the gray zone, which is below that threshold. There is, what's the kinetic equivalence? No, there is none. Now you can say in the in the real world, <coughs> or in the kinetic world, non-virtual world, information warfare isn't new. We in the Russians have been doing it for decades. So what's new about it in cyber? And the answer seems to be um, stealth, um, magnitude, how many people it can affect. Hundred thousand bots that are reproducing the information. That's a lot easier than paying uh, uh, journalists to slip it into the local French newspaper or something. You know, we did the Cold War, and so stealth and uh, magnitude are and low cost are uh, uh, make this. talking about things that are the equivalent of armed conflict. Um, we know how to deter it. <coughs> when we're below our, the level of armed conflict, it's much harder to figure out how, how to deter it. And it doesn't mean you can't do it. With the Chinese we, uh, who were stealing us blind intellectual property, we actually threatened sanctions and got them. Right, that was going to be my question. Why did it, why, were, why was it successful with the Chinese? And so far as we can tell, not successful with the Russians because Russia then repeated what they did in Germany, France. They're, they're continuing even after they've been called out on this. Well, there are two, there are two reasons. One is, uh, and in this article I argued that in the Cold War, and when we talk about uh, deterring nuclear strikes, talked very heavily about retaliation uh, and, uh, and or denial, but mostly retaliation. Um, but as we think about cyber, we have to realize that more mechanisms than the classic current mechanisms of retaliation and uh, denial, and that's entanglement and norms. And entanglement means that if are deeply entangled, you may not want to cause damage. So China is deeply entangled with the American economy and deeply dependent upon the internet for their strategy of economic growth. So both of their bilateral relations with the US, they don't want to bring down the American economy because it hurts them. And also, they don't want to totally disrupt the internet so entanglement exists with China. Russia, even Russians aren't that entangled. So there's a, uh, there's a, a significant difference there. The other point is that with China, we got their attention to reach the agreement between Xi and Obama at the September 2015 summit to not use cyber for commercial espionage. Um, because we threatened sanctions. And she wanted a good summit with the Americans. It was more focused on the overall relationship. So they changed Chinese declaratory policy 180 degrees in our direction and wrote it all down and took it to the G20. This big change in the gray area below the level of armed conflict. 
with the Russians, as I mentioned earlier, we were such a very In other words, we couldn't threaten the Russians with really fighting sanctions here, because we thought that might be their game of undercutting Clinton in the election. So we, we bit our tongue more than we should have bit our tongue. So that, that combination of less entanglement and self-deterrence uh, I think explains the difference between the two. Okay, I'm going to ask my last question, and then while you're answering that, I'll collect questions uh, from people I see in the hall. So one of your other uh, famous uh, concepts that you developed for theorists is the idea of soft power, getting other people to want the things that you want rather than coercive power, forcing them to do what you want to obtain inducements. And if you look at the last two years, it would seem that Putin's soft power was trending, was waxed. Uh, and if you say he was dissatisfied with the global order, just with the Western liberal international order, he was able to persuade a lot of people in a lot of countries, including in the United States, uh, a lot of voters, that that this uh, that, that his critique, and not attaching to Putin's name, but that the the anti-globalist critique was right, and that the, a nationalism that was much more comfortable for Putin was better option for the U.S., for France, for Germany, uh, for many European countries. So, uh, is that a vindication of the Joe Nye soft power? Uh, no, I don't. I don't. While you're answering that, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll. I don't think so because it, uh, soft power doesn't mean the use of ideas. Uh, Putin was using ideas as weapons, that's information warfare. It's not soft power. Soft power is the ability to get others to do what you want by attraction and persuasion rather than coercion or payment. I mean, if power is the ability to get others to do the things you want, you can do it three ways. You can do it by coercion, by payment, or by attraction. Um, Putin's use of ideas were generally to be disruptive uh, or they were weapons. They didn't attract many people to Russia or Putin. Uh, where you see Putin's soft power is in the uh, peripheral states, Belarus, Kazakhstan, so forth, Moldova, uh, uh, to some extent, where uh, the Russian Propaganda that was served out on RT, Russia Today, used to be called, does attract people. But if you look at RT, which is global, RT's listenership in the US is tiny. Not many people are attracted to Russia by Putin's ideas. Putin's ideas as information warfare, the West is corrupt, globalization is taking your job, so forth, that doesn't attract just undercuts and destroys. So Putin has been successful in information warfare. Information warfare is not so common. Uh, except, I mean, the one area where he has been successful in terms of attracting people has been on his periphery, particularly among Russian speakers who are outside the world. Okay. Oh, I can build off the soft power company did with the uh, smart power company he did in about 2004 and then again in 2007 with the uh, uh, armor um, with the smart power being the, the smart use of combining compelments with co you know uh, attraction with with coercion could you describe like a, a scenario where you would see cyber being used smartly across the range of of influence either by itself or in conjunction with other elements of, of power well you can use cyber uh, as a weapon as well as so uh, if you, uh, I mean, the whole business is fake news, in which you can start a story um, that uh, um, doesn't even have to be fake news. You say, uh, this is one of these, perhaps Obama should have done, which is called Putin. Uh, I'm going to expose your, your Swiss bank accounts, or I'm going to show the connections of corruption between you and Medvedev. And I'm going to have 100,000 bots that are going to be put 
putting this on every website you can get access to. And uh, uh, you either knock it off, or this is what I'll do. That's not really software, that's coercive. Uh, but it's the use of the internet. And maybe that, is, that threat uh, is, a, is a way to establish insurance. But soft power on, on the uh, in cyber would be to, uh, you know, what we do to develop websites to promote American ideals or ideas. So if you're saying, if I want to deal with, uh, um, if I want to deal with radical Islam, Your success in that, um, you, if you go on the web, you'll find uh, 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 you'll find many websites where people are. Al Laki, for example, is now dead, but you can uh, get him on your on your right now, and he will tell you about how to get jihad, and he is doing that through soft power. Say, well, how do we counter that? Well, we can take down a lot of these videos on YouTube. But probably even more important is for us to get across the idea that Muslims are welcome in this country and can live their own lives, say their own prayers, wear their own clothing as they wish, so that the people surround the extremist person who may be about to be recruited to terrorism, say, look, my son is going off the deep end. They tell that to the FBI. This happens. And the, the important thing is that if you look for a strategy against So in that sense, it, you know, you, you counter uh, radical Islamic terrorism. The hard, you need hard power to deal with the hard core. But unless you also have soft power, you're not going to get the intelligence and the cooperation with law enforcement that you need to apply your hard power intelligence. So that's that's an example of how hard and soft power can complement each other, or like smart power strategy. And what worries me now is what we're doing is taking a lot of measures to say to Muslims, you're not welcome here, we don't like you. You're strange, you're different. We're just knocking the hell out of our soft power and thinking that we're going to solve that by more bonds. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work. <coughs> so, bye. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, thank you for being here today. Um, would you speak specifically to uh, Putin's strategy of expanding Russia's reach? Um, and I'm thinking of Libya and Venezuela specifically, so more military. Libya. Libya and Venezuela. So Libya militarily, and then Venezuela with state-owned companies, you know, kind of uh, edging their way in as as um, Venezuela kind of encroached from, from inside. Um, so because these are two countries that are ripe for implosion, and Putin is clearly. Um, Making his weight felt there. What, sh what, if anything, should should our administ our current ad administration be doing to respond to those moves? And Joe, we have five more minutes and three more questions. Okay. Would <laughs> well, you want to start or, 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 or. Uh, Let's. Okay, we got that one. Let me get this one, and you can do two at a time. Uh, so I'm unfortunately don't have a complimentary question. My question is uh, just generally if you. Uh, your thoughts on um, the actions that the administration is taking to either 
to, to effectively pull out of the Paris Accord, the, the, uh, the, the Paris Agreement on climate change, um, and, and how that may or may not affect U.S. more if we're sort of practical, pragmatic. Okay. So you have two minutes to well, solve Venezuela okay. and climate change. I worry more about uh, the attraction of, uh, of Libyans to ISIL or ISIS than I do about attractions to Russia. The Russians really don't I mean, people say, you know, there is an authoritarian ideology, Putin is promoting it, and it's, it's providing a lot of soft power. I don't see it. I mean, unlike the 1930s, where communism was attractive to a lot, and fascism was too, there really isn't one authoritarian ideology in Putin's efforts to promote it. Um, he, he can meddle in places like Venezuela. But um, I worry more about ISIS and Putin's going to be. A, Putin is, is going to create his own antibodies. And, and, and I'm not sure. I hope ISIS will, but I'm not sure. On Paris and climate, um, what's interesting so far is that the administration has dismantled a number of executive orders that Obama put in place. <laughs> Interesting question is, uh, I was talking to somebody in the energy area about this last night. Uh, it takes years to actually uh, change the effect of these executive orders, the lawyers that challenge and so forth. A and B, a lot of the large companies have already made their investment plans on the theory that whatever you So you're not getting the big push from the big companies right out of Paris. And that means that the damage that Trump will do in four years um, probably won't be a, uh, as crucial as we think. I mean, it's going to be bad, but it's not going to make as big a difference as we think. Withdrawing from Paris so that you gave a signal if it were to give a signal to these companies which are planning uh, on the basis that there will be some general price on the carpet. But uh, one of these people I was talking to last night who was a big hedge fund investor invests in energy uh, uh, says by and large the people who are making these investments are going to be driven by the market and they see the market Thank you for being here, sir. Uh, you kind of mentioned how egregious cyber warfare attacks can be construed as an act of war, but unfortunately, there's really not a lot of descriptive international framework that governs how cyber warfare can be conducted. 
Do you think we can apply uh, things like the international humanitarian law and the proportionality military necessity to cyber warfare? Or do we need to develop some other sort of framework that can effectively govern how we conduct cyber warfare? My opinion is a little bit different. Thank you so much for being here. I read to you a lot on my, all my textbooks. So, <laughs> so I want to ask you about Bannon, about his removal from National Security Council. Does that show an inconsistency in the Trump administration? Or does that show that it what makes the Trump administration go forward to be better, more consistent? Uh, they, 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 two questions could be the same <laughs> But let me, let me take them in the order that they came. Um, yes, you can apply laws of armed conflict to cyber. In fact, that's official American doctrine. We have stated that if we're going to treat cyber warfare as something which is the equivalent of kinetic warfare, so as people are killed and hurt, then you should not hurt civilians. The possible principle discrimination that you just described, and there has to be proportionality. You know, to bring about a huge grid just for some small offense or something. And so that is our official doctrine. The problem uh, is, you know, is implemented. But what's interesting is we, there's a UN group of government experts on cyber, which has issued a report, and, and the last report is in uh, last year. And they have, we <coughs> So it's an extremely important question in the area, um, but uh, we are moving in, in that direction. And on a high note.
you have a tug of war that's going on with the White House between the, the bomb throwers and the crackers and the practices. But as the department staff up, and as you're getting a more <coughs> stable structure in the NSC, And I, so I think what you're seeing is, uh, Peter and I were talking about this earlier, it's like court politics of uh, Versailles or, or Henry VIII's camp in court. I mean, you know, it's, it, there is a king, and the king keeps the people guessing against each other. Somebody, I guess, Bannon himself called himself the Cromwell, mm -hmm. uh, 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 which is not a very good sign because Cromwell lost his head. <laughs> But uh, I'll end it by saying when I, when uh, Bannon was first appointed to the NSC, I wrote a tweet that said that uh, uh, I guess if Caligula could make people come to that Bannon, they would say That's a, that's a total nonpartisan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've taken us on a remarkable tour at 60,000 foot level, 600 foot level, across a wide range of issues. I think my staff can now see why I was so excited that you were coming. Uh, and it was, uh, it's, it's been a fascinating moment for that. We're very much in your debt, so thank you.